around 0, 130, that's when we start the preparation for breakfast. We pull out our bacon, we pull out our fresh eggs, all our products. In one of six galleys aboard the USS John C. Stennis, 38 food service personnel are preparing breakfast for a small navy. We serve about almost 5,000 personnel, and the challenge is we have to be managing our time wisely as far as feeding personnel. On a typical morning, the sailors will consume 10,000 eggs, 3,100 strips of bacon, 250 gallons of juice, 1,800 pancakes, and 215 pounds of potatoes. Technology has helped us out. We have frozen foods on board and have the same quality and nutrition for our sailors. There's a lot of pre-prepared food that it minimizes the preparation time. These sailors enjoy a tasty and nutritious breakfast despite being 100 miles out at sea. The credit lies with past innovators who found ways to blend food science and technology with Mother Nature. And now, thanks to that blend, more people than ever have a variety of breakfast foods to choose from. In America, breakfasts reflect a melting pot of regional delights. But one breakfast stands above the rest, bacon and eggs. America's early years, bacon and eggs was really the breakfast of farmers, of people who lived near those ingredients. That's where they could get fresh food. And those lucky, wealthy people who could have eggs and bacon freshly brought into their estates and homes. In the 1930s, refrigeration made bacon and eggs available to more people. But Americans had yet to fully embrace it as their breakfast of choice. Enter Edward Bernays, the man who turned bacon and eggs into an American tradition. He's called the founder of modern PR, public relations. He worked for the bacon industry. He sent out this interesting questionnaire to over 5,000 doctors across America. Bernays' crafty questionnaire asked the doctors if a hearty breakfast was good for Americans. The doctors overwhelmingly backed Bernays' ambiguous inquiry. Bernays then sold the public on his version of a hearty breakfast. Bacon and eggs. America bought it. Modern technology made it a sensation. In 2005, nearly 90 million hogs were slaughtered in the U.S. for human consumption. Many of them ended up at the Tyson Pork Factory, a leading producer that has been making bacon since the 1970s. Pork bellies are received in the facility on refrigerated semi-trailers. This facility will run about 600,000 pounds in a day's time. The time from harvest that the um, pork bellies are harvested from the animal until it comes in to this facility is about one day. In the U.S., bacon slices are culled from the two bellies of a hog, located on each side of the animal. The English carve their bacon from the bellies and the back of the animal, where the fat content is considerably less. Canadian bacon, the leanest of all, is also taken from the back, but from the tender center loin portion. However it's sliced, once it reaches the factory, the pig's final journey to the breakfast table is well underway. In this part of the process, the bellies are being staged to remove the skin and begin the injection process. It goes through a heavy roller, which only flattens the belly out so that we can allow for proper removal of the skin. This piece of equipment has a series of rollers and a knife that will remove about three-eighths of an inch of the belly that also removes the skin from the belly. Once the skin is removed, it's transferred on this conveyor to another packing station. These skins are used for gelatin use or popping for the production of pork rinds. Before modern processing, Preserving bacon meant soaking the pork in salt or brine for several days. This prevented the meat from spoiling by pulling out the moisture and creating a barren environment for bacteria growth. In modern bacon curing, a blend of chemicals is injected into the bellies, creating the same reaction as salt and brine in mere hours. This is where the curing ingredients are injected into the pork belly. Inside this injector, 
There are 168 needles that are injecting a solution of water, salt, sugar, sodium phosphate, sodium erythorbate, and sodium nitrite into the belly. The water acts as a medium to transfer the ingredients into the belly. The salt and sugar are flavoring agents. Sodium phosphate is a processing aid that allows moisture retention. Sodium erythorbate and sodium nitrite are the curing agents. Before these pig bellies go to market, they enter the thermal processing unit, where they're heated at 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and the aroma of smoldering wood chips is introduced to add a smoky flavor. Once they've cooled for 36 to 72 hours, it's down the stretch they go and into a stainless steel labyrinth of modern machinery. First, the bellies are pressed into rectangular blocks and prepared for slicing. slicer, it crosses a slicing blade which is traveling at 1500 revolutions per minute. As this bacon is being sliced, it's being sliced into one pound units. It's also calculating the net weight of that package of bacon with the number of predetermined slices in each package. As it moves across this area of the slicer, the bacon transfers onto the primary label of the product which also allows the bacon draft to move down the processing line. At the end of the line, the bacon slices are vacuum packed and ready for market. What's in one thick slice? 175 calories, 25% of the FDA's daily allowance for fat and 9% of the recommended amount of protein. The process of putting the other half of the great American breakfast on the plate is equally industrial. Chickens weren't indigenous to America. The ones the pilgrims bought, those chickens, those good layers from their hometowns, were really the beginning of our egg industry. America's egg industry produces and distributes over 75 billion eggs a year. Such volume takes a little dose of science and a heavy helping of reproductive manipulation. Eglin's Best in Pennsylvania is on the cutting edge of today's egg industry. Science has surely brought egg production a long way from what it was uh, 100 or 200 years ago when hens were just foraging for whatever kind of food items they could get. The first rule of thumb in commercial chicken farming is uncomplicated. What goes in a hen comes out in its egg. To that end, today's hens are fed a well-rounded diet of corn, soybean meal, and a variety of minerals and vitamins. But some hens are naturally more productive than others, like these at Eglin's best test farm. This breed of chicken is called uh, white leghorn. It's been selected for many years for a high rate of egg production. And they will lay about 270 eggs per year. And they will do this very efficiently for about two years. Getting hens to lay almost 300 eggs per year does, however, require some assistance. Light. The mechanism of light stimulation inside a hen is a photoreceptor. When the day length and the intensity of light increase, the photoreceptor perceives this increase in day length and intensity and brings about an increase in the hormones that are responsible for the maturation of the hen that leads to egg production. Cage chickens will spend their entire lives soaking up light inside a hen house. Cage-free hens can roam around open, lighted barns, while free-range chickens are allowed to wander outside the barn for short periods. Regardless of the accommodations, after about two years, the fertility of the hens begins to wane, and younger hens are brought in to replace them. These hens will be used for pet food or other food items like meat pies or chicken. and then a new group of hens will have to be used for egg production. But long before the laying hens buy the farm, their eggs enter the process of commercial production. At an Eglin's Best packaging facility, 
Eggs drop from cages onto a conveyor that transports them through a tunnel system. The fragile cargo glides smoothly over oiled rollers and into the processing plant. Here we're at the beginning stage where the eggs are actually gathered. This whole system is controlled by sensors. If there's a buildup of eggs, uh, this belt will stop while the machine still runs, which allows us to clear this area to allow more eggs to flow through the conveyor system. First, the conveyor carries the eggs through a series of tanks where any soiling matter is removed. And in this tank, we also have a sanitizer, which is a chlorine base with water in this pipe here. And the water is actually 120 degrees for our final rinse to make sure the egg is sanitary. Once the eggs are blown dry, they enter a candling booth. Here, they move over a set of lights that allow the candler to see past the shell and into the egg. The candler looks for blood spots and other imperfections. Any eggs that fail the test are discarded. Cracked eggs are plucked from the line and later turned into liquid and powder products. Eggs that make the grade continue through the system where they're weighed by a computer and directed into the appropriate basket for packaging. The eggs are placed into the cartons face down as this for two reasons. One, there's an air sac at the top of the egg, so the egg by gravity falls face down. This allows us for a larger surface to be stamped with when they're stamped, and also the bottom of the egg's a little stronger, so when they're placed into the carton, it allows for less breakage. Locked and loaded, the cartons are carefully packed on pallets and stored at 45 degrees. But before their trip to the supermarket, random samples are taken by on-site government food inspectors who check the eggs for safety. Nutritionally, the standard American egg is a bit of a contradiction. 80 calories and 10% of the recommended daily amount of protein make it lean and healthy. But with 66% of the daily limit on cholesterol, eggs have some health professionals scrambling. The egg industry has responded with products like egg beaters that use only the cholesterol-free egg whites. Other companies like Eglin's Best have gone even further with the development of a scientifically enhanced designer egg. The nutritional composition of an egg can be varied considerably according to the diet of the hen. It makes it possible to increase the omega-3 fatty acids, to increase most vitamins, a lot of minerals and different antioxidants as well to make the egg more healthy for us. By changing the hen's diet with the addition of the good fat known as omega-3, overall cholesterol from a generic egg can be lowered by about 20%. While adapting to the health-conscious consumer, America's favorite hearty breakfast seems to have a golden future. And when it comes to health, there's nothing better than starting America's favorite breakfast with a glass of orange juice. Aboard the USS John C. Stennis, it may take six hours for food service personnel to make breakfast, but it only takes a couple to devour it. Hundreds start their meal with orange juice. And by breakfast's end, sailors will have guzzled their way through more than 75 reconstituted gallons. We're uh, changing up uh, concentrated orange juice, which is at a 4 to 1 juice ratio with water that's read by a computer machine that is sent through a compressor and out to the soda machines out there. We use the distilling plant units down in the plants to purify ocean water, the salt water, so that way people can drink the water and that way we are able to carry more juice on board and store for a longer time. The orange, one of nature's most simple and nourishing pleasures. To the Greeks, they were golden apples. To Romans, the food of the gods. For early Americans, oranges were a rare and expensive treat, reserved for special occasions. It was a big deal if you got in your Christmas stocking one orange. It was a big treat to try an orange, to taste an orange. In fact, what they would do to extend the orange juice was squeeze the orange juice and then add water and sugar. They made orange aid. Today, oranges are ubiquitous. Grown from China to Brazil, the world now feasts on the fruit once reserved for royalty. In the U.S., Florida and California growers harvest nearly 25 billion oranges every year. 
In Brazil, the harvest is nearly twice that. And for good reason. For beneath its skin lies a power-packed assortment of vitamins and minerals. And as much potassium as a banana. Maybe that's why orange juice is on more American breakfast tables than any other juice. And it's the business of the Sunkist Juice Plant in Tipton, California, to make sure none of nature's nutrients are lost along the way. We handled the orange variety at this plant. Plant's capacity is about 1,800 tons a day, or about three truckloads an hour. We, in turn, offload that fruit, tilt the truck up to about a 25-degree angle, and let gravity carry the fruit out of the truck. As the oranges begin their shuffle toward the plant, random samples are captured through a trap door and sent to an on-site lab for testing. Oranges containing 11.5% sugar or higher are usually separated for concentrating. But the final factor is always the tester's taste buds. Only the best tasting oranges become single strength. All others become concentrate. Single strength juice is uh, ready to drink, meaning that the customer is going to get freshly extracted juice and it does not go through any concentration processes. Separated for either single strength or concentrate, the oranges are prepped to enter the facility. Right down here where you see the water spraying on the fruit, we're washing the fruit. It's important that we do so, so that we can remove the residual sugars and, and surface contamination that gets on the orange from the time that it leaves the packing house until the time it arrives here. After spending nearly a year soaking up the sunshine, the oranges move out of the light and into the juice plant. Inside, inspectors remove defective and decaying oranges. Those that pass continue on toward a bed covered with thousands of tiny pins. Rolling atop the pins, the orange peels are punctured, just enough to release their precious oil. The oil from the peel comes here. And what we're doing is removing the oil from the water that we're getting from the next room. We then take that water oil emulsion and pump it through this polisher. And this polisher removes the oil from the water. This oil is used in flavorings, also used in oil or furniture polish and uh, insect repellent on your patio, that sort of thing. The orange's advance continues toward the extractors. They slide over a series of openings that swallow the fruit based on size. The smaller ones drop first, the larger ones seconds later. Into the extractors they fall. Designed after the same utensils used in the home, oranges are cradled into a cup and sliced in half. The orange halves then move into a twisting, cone-studded reamer. At a rate of 700 per minute, oranges are squeezed and the juice is released into a catch basin below. The peels fall onto a conveyor and are transported through a series of grinders where they're minced into a fine powder loaded on trucks, and later made into cattle feed. The orange peel is high in acetic acid. Acetic acid is a component of butter fat. So if you feed the cow orange peel, the cow is going to have a higher butter fat content in the milk, making the milk worth more to the dairyman. Meanwhile, the freshly extracted juice has hit a fork in the road. Single strength heads to cold storage for packaging concentrate, it's off to the evaporators. During the evaporating process, what we're doing under heat and vacuum is removing about 80% of the water that's in the juice. So if you're starting with a gallon, you're going to end up with about 20% of a gallon of juice. To bring it back to single strength, you merely have to add back that 80% to bring that back up to single strength orange juice. Since its development in the 1940s, Concentrating was the method that allowed most people to enjoy orange juice. That was until the 1950s, when the founder of another juice giant, Tropicana, devised a way to keep orange juice fresher longer. Anthony Rossi was a Sicilian immigrant to the United States, and he started out in the fruit distribution business. He started out shipping those wonderful crates of oranges and grapefruits up north from Florida. And then he started to develop a way to squeeze the juice and send it up north and distribute it in glass containers. 
Rossi's team of scientists developed the process called flash pasteurization. The juice was quickly heated for 15 seconds, then chilled, which inactivated the natural enzymes, slowing the deterioration process. This allowed Tropicana to store their juice in glass bottles without refrigeration. Rossi also figured out a way to get his juice to the consumer without losing precious time. His specially insulated Great White Juice Train still chugs across the East and Midwest. Today, the sterilization process enables freshly squeezed juice to survive even longer. Using an ingenious system called the shelf and tube method, the juice enters into a series of pipes at 35 degrees. Inside the sterilizer, the cold raw juice moves inside a clump of tubes, positioned inside a single larger tube. The larger tube contains sterilized juice, which has been heated to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. As they pass each other, the juices share their temperatures, boosting the colder juice toward the 210 degrees needed for sterilization. After the juice has been sterilized and cooled back down to 35 degrees, um, it leaves the sterilizer and gets pumped directly into one of our one million gallon storage tanks. Sterilizing allows us to store the juice aseptically and for a long period of time. We can store juice in these tanks for up to a year without any flavor degradation. That gives us a chance to process the juice when we have it and then market the juice to the customers through the whole year. It will be pumped from the vats into tanker trucks and sent to market with nearly 95% of the orange's nutrients. Whether it's concentrated, fresh, or sterilized, every glass of orange juice still contains the nutritional value from the grow. 90 calories, several essential vitamins, folate for the heart, and as much potassium as a banana. Another one of nature's gifts has also had a healthy effect on breakfast, despite having temporarily lost its way. A bowl of cereal. Comfort food even aboard the USS John C. Stennis. On this morning, sailors will slurp their way through 24 cases of it, and everyone has a favorite. One of the things I love about the cereal selection we have is that we're out in the middle of the ocean on a warship, and it's kind of like having a little bit of home with you here. It's like bringing back childhood memories, you know, sitting back with your family, eating. Lucky Charms is like the one, the hot one that goes off. Everybody loves it. For the baby smart start, seems like we're all trying to watch our weight. In the mid-1800s, America was also watching its weight, struggling to shed the hefty breakfast foods of a different era. We moved away from being a farm country where people were working hard in the fields to more sedentary jobs. But people didn't change their diets. They were still eating those huge, heavy breakfasts. Something had to give, and what gave was their health. Gout was rampant in the 1800s. In 1863, Dr. James Caleb Jackson, a strict vegetarian, concluded that the fiberless American diet was responsible for the epidemic. He turned to nature for the remedy. He developed granula with a U. It was basically a dried whole wheat that was rich in bran, and he dried it, toasted it, dried it again, and chopped it up. It was hard as a rock. You had to soak it in water overnight to be able to eat it, but it was healthy. Sanitarium owner Dr. John Kellogg took notice. Dedicated to healing through holistic medicine and nutrition, Kellogg recognized that Jackson's granula could help his patients, if only they could get it down. He worked out a technique by rolling the grain and then baking it to have it flake. And so he created the first flaked whole grain cereal, much lighter than the granula that Dr. Jackson came up with. Easier to chew, quicker to prepare. With the improved flake, the Kellogg Cereal Company opened its doors. Soon they introduced other grain flakes. The public loved it. Dozens of cereal companies followed. At Nature's Path Cereal Company in Washington State, cereal is made around the clock using the latest technique called extrusion. This is the beginning of the process where raw materials come in, they get lifted up into this station. They go from here over into 
a conveyor system that takes it into a mixing tank. It'll send it over to the extruder. At this point in the process, the vast majority of cereal companies use a different technique called batch processing. With it, grains and flavoring agents are placed in pressurized cylindrical drums. As the drums rotate, the ingredients are cooked at a low temperature for several hours. With extrusion, the raw grains and wet ingredients are quickly pressure cooked using high heat. Once the grains are in the system, flavoring agents are added and the mixture is sent to the extruder. Here we are at our extruder where we take dry ingredients, we mix them with our wet ingredients like sugar, salt, water, and barley malt. They go through the extrusion process. Then they get over here, they go through this tube in a dough form, they go into the former where they get cut into little beads. From here on, the batch and extrusion methods are identical. To form the beads, the cereal dough is pushed through a small circular die and then into a slicer. The beads are then sent to the flaker room, where they're squashed between two steel drums and 40,000 pounds of pressure. Fully shaped, the flakes are vacuumed through pipes and into the cooking system. The flakes come from the bead room overhead they get sent over into this shaker belt. The shaking to equally distribute those flakes across this belt so they can be consistently heated through the ovens. Once inside the ovens, the flakes dance under a series of tubes. They cook them with streams of hot air. You can see the tubes in here that cause the agitation in the flakes. Those flakes come out of the oven and on this belt, they get transferred to a bucket elevator and into the cooling process. The flakes move through an air cooler, and in this case, into a blend of other cereal ingredients. The blended grains now enter the area where each cereal company distinguishes its products, the flavoring screw. Here we've taken our blended cereal where we've combined multiple products together. They come into this screw here where we add the coating. The coating is sprayed equally into this product. The coating gets sprayed through these nozzles and equally distributed on this product. This coating's got a little almond flavor with a little bit of sugar. Adding just a little bit of sugar is much different from many cereal recipes. In the 1930s, cereal companies began adding spoonfuls of sugar as a way to entice an untapped market. They started to realize that it could be big business for kids. Moms are busy, want their kids to eat something before they leave the house, so it became a great food for kids. By the 1950s, a sugar-laden barrage aimed at children propelled the cereal market into hyperdrive. Cereal evolved from a wholesome product that was designed originally for health and then it got off the track. It became heavily sugared, preserved with chemical preservatives, colored. We started to learn, especially in the 80s, that we needed to provide better nutrition for kids. And so there became a strong movement away from sweet cereals and to healthy whole grain alternatives. Okay, here we have the final product coming out of the oven for the last time. It's been coated and flavored and ready to go. The product here will go along this belt into the packaging lines where it will ultimately be sent to the super... After drifting from its intended direction, cereal has come full circle. At nature's path, whole grains and flavoring agents are all grown organically. Because of their success, other companies are following suit. The baby boomers were the ones who grew up on sugary cereals and other junk foods. And today, they're now in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and they want product that's good for them. In 2005, cereal sales in the U.S. topped $6 billion. Credit goes to two visionaries, Dr. Jackson, the man who invented the jaw-breaking granola, and Dr. John Kellogg for making it palatable. In the 1970s, another invention helped to create a different breakfast category, breakfast on the go. 
In today's fast-paced world, millions of us eat breakfast on the run. Waiting for us are quick stop restaurants, cranking out everything from breakfast burritos to hot donuts. But one express eater recaptured its share of mornings in 1973 with an invention that has since become an American breakfast icon. The man responsible was Herb Peterson, a McDonald's franchise owner who helped send the Golden Arches into breakfast history. One thing that was missing in McDonald's around the world was breakfast. Well, that s stimulated me to consider what might be used for breakfast. And I had liked Eggs Benedict, and that was where the idea really came from. Peterson set out to harness the ingredients of Eggs Benedict into an easy-to-eat sandwich. First, he substituted cheese for the messy hollandaise sauce. Next, Peterson needed a way to keep an egg tidy inside a sandwich. We developed this little egg ring. A blacksmith in Santa Barbara made this for me, and then we covered it with Teflon so it would slip right off. Which made, the obviously, the egg now held in its place, and now you could have a handheld breakfast sandwich. So, it's, it, you know, the technology really, uh, that's what's neat about it. It really hasn't changed too much. A simple concept has stayed a simple concept. All that's happened is this ring is multiplied a little bit. When Peterson added a piece of Canadian bacon and put it all on an English muffin, he created the first fast food breakfast sandwich. He called it the Egg McMuffin. McDonald's owner Ray Kroc loved it and pronounced his restaurants open for breakfast. And now McDonald's has expanded on the breakfast sandwich with the McGriddle, a sweet handheld temptation that holds all the ingredients of the classic American breakfast. Bacon or sausage, egg, and cheese inside two maple syrup-filled pancakes. At a plant in Prosperity, South Carolina, McGriddle pancake makers have worked out a way to keep the sticky maple syrup off the customer's fingers. This is a room where we make the maple nugget that goes inside the McGriddle. The process is we put all our dry ingredients up in a blender, blends, mixes, drops into what we call a hole in hopper, goes up a conveyor to the pellet mill where it's compressed to a specific size. When it comes out of the caisson sifter, this is the product you get. It actually goes into the process for McGriddle. As the nuggets are processed, Pancake ingredients are sifted and sent to a mixing hopper. Well, here's the maple nuggets. As you can see, Anita's getting ready to drop it in, which will actually drop into the bowl and go through its cycle and mix right into the batter. Fifty-gallon drums hoist the batter to a depositor that sends the mixture toward the oven. Just before entering, Cast iron plates engraved with the McDonald's logo are sprayed with oil and then filled with batter. The trip through the oven takes less than a minute. This is the finished product as it comes out the oven. Um, as you can see, it's got the McDonald's logo on it. We'll break it open. There's your nuggets that's melted and distributed through the product. We make basically 553 cakes per minute, and on a five-day week, we we'll produce about 3.9 million cakes in a five-day work week. But not all of the pancakes are perfect. As they pass through a laser beam, a high-speed image detects any defects. Bad pancakes are blown off the line and into the trash. The pancakes that pass enter a blast freezer. As you can see, now that the products come through the freezer in a frozen state, it goes up the conveyor, goes over into a scale system. The scale system looks for a certain combination of weight versus count, so we can get 48 McGriddles per bag. Once it finds that combination, it'll drop it into a bag, and then we bag it before we put it into a box. The pancakes are now ready to meet the other McGriddle ingredients. From separate facilities around the country, pre-cooked bacon and sausage, fresh eggs and cheese are shipped to individual McDonald's restaurants. There, eggs are cooked, ingredients are assembled, and the McGriddle sandwich is ready for pickup. What you'll get is 450 calories, 32% of which are from fat. But you'll also receive 40% of your daily protein. For those on the run looking for something a little lighter, 
the Carnation Company is stirring up an alternative. Breakfast in a glass. In the early 1960s, Carnation began to experiment with powdered products that would supply all of the nutrients in a typical breakfast. The magic combination turned out to be non-fat milk powder for protein, vitamins and minerals, maltodextrin, a natural cornstarch as a carbohydrate, calcium, thickener, and sugar and cocoa for taste. Instant Breakfast was ready for the public. The product manager on Instant Breakfast was my father, Jack McDonald. So he would bring home packets of the powder, and these were prototypes, and he would ask my brother and sister and I to try them. So it was many, many months of testing this product, and it had to taste good. And of course, as a child, I liked the chocolate. Just mix one envelope Carnation Instant Breakfast with fresh whole milk. Stir. In 1965, Carnation Instant Breakfast was launched aimed directly at the real head of the household. The marketing campaign focused on moms as the gatekeeper for their families. And I remember a woman that you would describe probably as a traditional housewife. Breakfast skippers. And she would say to the camera, don't be a breakfast skipper. Make sure you have a nutritious breakfast. Don't be a breakfast skipper. Try the balanced breakfast. The concept caught on fast. An instant breakfast took its place next to other symbolic images of the era. Okay, let's start with strawberry. Carnation food scientists are constantly trying to keep instant breakfast a step ahead of the latest food trends. And so far, they've been successful. Everybody, let's try the chocolate right now. The recent addition of a dark chocolate flavored mix provides the same amount of antioxidants as a cup of green tea. Carnation also produces zero sugar products. Inside the original chocolate powder is a vitamin and mineral packed 130 calories. Just 1% of the daily value for fat and 9% of the protein allowance. Not bad for a breakfast made in a laboratory. Getting another of America's favorite breakfast foods to the table requires a slightly simpler procedure. On land or at sea, classic American breakfast isn't complete without a side of toast. Making it is a simple process. Bread in, radiant heat scorches the bread, and out comes a crisp piece of toast, ready to eat. But originally, toasting bread had a more practical purpose. Preservation. It's got roots back in the Middle Ages. As soon as bread was invented, cooks pretty quickly realized that if you toast it, it lasts longer. With electricity came the first toasters, odd-looking contraptions made of wire and heating coils. Thanks to some faulty designs, toasting bread was like playing with fire. One of the signs of the early toasters where you used to have to turn it around with some kind of a device, usually your fingers, hoped you didn't get burnt. There were other problems as well. The heating coils, made from iron or copper, would become brittle and break. In 1905, engineer Albert Marsh invented an alloy called nichrome, a mixture of nickel and chromium that could be heated thousands of times without breaking. Toasters were ready to burn their way through breakfast history. Tom Osden and his son Stefan have been collecting toasters since 1989. Lining the walls of their family home are hundreds of toasters, relics that exhibit the evolving inventiveness of American toaster manufacturers. They start rather simple. They become more elaborate. And then as the Depression comes in, they're simplified. Then the World War II comes and there's a metal shortage. And so you're still having relatively simple things with little metal. Now, in the 50s, it's the advent of the pop-up toaster. And now you're beginning to get something more complicated again. You find that some of the toasters in the 50s and 60s are made rather elaborate timing mechanisms. They pop out. Also, you find that the toasters are getting much cheaper. And frankly, a lot of them from the 60s on are very cheaply made and probably no longer American. As they worked their way through history, several toasters stood out. In the 1920s, 
Toasters capable of cooking a complete breakfast hit the market. One part here, on top we have a waffle maker. The next one we have the actual toaster itself. Make your toast. The next device here is for frying bacon. And finally, here we have an egg poacher. So you could do a whole breakfast at your table. Some toasters went beyond cooking and into the mildly entertaining. The famous 1930s toastalator came with a view to the action. It's got a little porthole in the middle and you can watch it go past. It is an amusing toaster because it goes in as a piece of white bread and falls out at the other end. It's a toast. Voila, a perfect piece of toast. Other toasters were pieces of movable art. Function was secondary. There's a beauty in them. And we get to some very wonderful shapes. We also get some toasters which are bizarre in as what they can do. It's complicated, a matter which is very simple. Although at times simplicity has been lost in the design, it's the practical advances that have kept toasters viable, like the pop-up feature. With the original pop-up toasters, electricity from the outlet heats up a temperature sensor, called a thermocouple. Once it hits a pre-calibrated temperature, it releases a catch, sending the toast carriage upward. The thermocouple simultaneously shuts off the electricity. Since the 1970s, manufacturers have returned to producing multitasker toasters. Toasters have morphed into bagel bakers, hot dog heaters, pizza parlors, and sandwich shops. I find from the sheer appearance, they are no longer very interesting. They do many more things. They produce good toast, but they're not very pretty or interesting. For collectors, the golden years of toaster design are over, and a new era of utility has begun. But inventions like the toaster will continue to inspire new alternative breakfast foods. As food science and technology continue to merge, who knows what the next generation will be eating for breakfast? One area where I think is a huge advance is handheld breakfast. I think the granola bar is sort of cereal in a bar. I could see a bacon and egg bar, maybe a pancake bar. Why not even pancake chips? Meanwhile, aboard the USS John C. Stennis, breakfast is finally over. As sailors clean up and prepare to go to work, all across America, the utensils of breakfast technology continue to squeeze, slice, bake, and mix the most important meal of the day. This man knew his invention could change the world, but he didn't do it for science or even the money. He did it for a reason few might suspect. Alexander Graham Bell's incredible machine was inspired by his work with people who couldn't even hear. Don't miss Alexander Graham Bell and the Astonishing Telephone on Man Moment Machine, next on the History Channel.